please tell me if this starts moving about with my tie and I'll move it just in case there's any interference. Well, good evening everyone, it's good to be with you. Let's just turn this back on. Is that it? There we go. Perfect. It's really good to be with you. Thank you for having me. It's good to see everyone in the hall this evening. I really miss the singing, I have to say. I'm sure you're the same. Of all the things we're learning this year, and we're learning a lot of things in this very strange year, we're learning the talents of the Sherwin family, and that was, uh, that was very nice, so thank you for that. Um, I would like to read some verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, please, tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And uh, my topic tonight, uh, I don't make any apologies for this. I guess I might not be the only speaker that comes on this platform this year that will have this in mind, is our own mortality. It's almost unavoidable, isn't it, in a year like this one. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which is very well-known words from the scriptures, and even if you've not been to church, you will possibly recognise these verses from different occasions. I actually went to a school where they read from the Bible almost every day, it's quite unusual. And uh, four days a week at assembly, there would be a portion of scripture that we read. And um, there were a number of passages that you'd imagine were favourites. The Lord's My Shepherd was one of them, of course. This one was on the loop. This was a favourite. And I want to think about the context of these verses this evening. Because when I was a young teenager, um, I used to hear these being read over and over again at school. I had absolutely no idea what to make of it. So I want to think about what has been said in these verses. So we're going to read verses um, in chapter 3, please, and we'll read verses 1 to 12. And it says here, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, a time to weep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. Now we'll go over please to John, the Gospel of John. And uh, we will read as most speakers would say, the most famous verse in the Bible. But I really want to think about verses 17 and 18 of John chapter 3. So John chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 16. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And we believe that God will add a blessing to the public reading of his word. Mortality has been on our minds. It's inescapable. Right from the very first week of this year, we had a funeral at our church. A dear brother went to be with the Lord. Straight away this year, we were faced with mortality. And it wasn't long after that that we had the problem with the virus that started. As I mentioned before, we're learning a lot of things, aren't we? And the fear of death is one of the big ones in society. What's been interesting for me, though, is the context of numbers. You may or may not be the same. I wrote down this way back in January, and I'm still looking at it right now. I could have updated it. Could leave you to do that yourself for any region, any time period, or any country. But I remember back, I think early February, I wrote this down that in China, 213 people died of the virus. That was the official number, 213. What I was interested in though was how many people died in China in total in 
in that month, just the month of January. It really shocked me when I read the number that 868,787 people had died in China in the month of January, outside of COVID. That's a massive number, right? The context of numbers. And I guess this debate rages about the number of deaths from COVID and what are the consequences and what we should do based on the number of deaths and the risks from COVID. I'm not here to make any statement on that whatsoever. We all have our own views. The reality is though, if we do reach 2 million deaths, we need to remember the context here, that every single year in the world, somewhere between 60 and 80 million people will die. That's the number that really speaks to me. We talk about death rates, is it 0.7%, is it 1%, what about age groups? It's actually, in some ways, irrelevant in the big scheme of fatality. Because the death rate, as we all know, is 100%. Everybody, every one of us, is going to die one day. Morbid statement, true statement. There is a time to be born, says the one of God. And there is a time to die. I have a friend at work, and I have to say that the debates on COVID are raging right now in my work. <laughs> With every week that goes by. And I've got a friend, I've known him since 2006, we've worked together all that time, and we have a lot of conversations, but Luke, and you can pray for Luke, Luke is a, an atheist, and would constantly tell me that he is an atheist, and we would debate back and forward. But I have noticed in Luke, who I would describe somewhat as a happy-go-lucky guy at times, that the fear of death is definitely upon him at the moment. I asked him the other day that, should we lock down the whole of the country to save one person, just one? He said to me, yes. Now he looks a great guy. <laughs> and I said to him, is that a rational answer? Is that a rational answer? Again, we can have our own views on these things. I want to ask you, just at the start of our meeting this evening, what is the value that you would place on your own life? What is the value that you would place on your own soul? And I'm not interested in debating that amongst your peers. You would almost could call that a horizontal debate when you start to look at yourself and your value relative to somebody else. It's, not, it's a bit of a waste of time actually in that. I'm interested in the vertical. What's the value that God places on your life and on your soul? We can debate how much precaution we should be taking to save one life down here but the Bible tells me what God did. The value that he has placed on your life and on your soul is that he sent his only son into the world. To go to the cross at Calvary, to suffer and to die a horrific death, and to pay the price for your sin and for my sin. That you might be saved. That your soul might be saved. That you may have eternal life. That is the value that God has placed on your life and of your soul. I wonder, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour this evening? Have you ever trusted him as that, as your Saviour? Now getting to our passage, and we're very much going to come back to this, a time to be born and a time to die, but I want to think about a little bit of the, the bit in between and the context of this, this chapter in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes. The writer is a man called Solomon. The shortened story is that Solomon was the king of Israel. He was the great king David's son. And he was the wealthiest and the wisest man in the world. The Bible would tell us that God asked him what he wanted and, God, and he asked God for wisdom. And God was so impressed with his answer that he didn't just give him tremendous wisdom, he gave him all the wealth beside. This was the wealthiest and the wisest man on the earth at that particular time. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon has gone out and he is searching through the world with all his resources and all his wisdom. And he is really trying to find out the meaning of life. He is trying to find out how he can find lasting satisfaction. And surely if anyone was going to be able to come up with that answer, it would be this man. As I say, the wealthiest and the wisest man with no shortage of resources or intellect to go with it. 
It says in this book, on numerous occasions, under the sun. In fact, 59 times it says this little phrase, under the sun. Solomon was searching under the sun. Looking at every angle, looking at history, looking at different things that he could perceive and he could observe to come up with his conclusions. But this under the sun phrase is important because as he looked under the sun, unfortunately in this book of Ecclesiastes, very rarely if ever does he take into account above the sun. Very rarely if ever does the revelation of God and the truth of God come in. So Solomon is out there using his own wisdom to come to his conclusion. But that's not to say that God is not mentioned. Forty times in this book, God is mentioned. But interestingly enough, the Hebrew word that is used is Elohim, which is God the Creator. So there is this concept of God in this book as the mighty Creator. It's not as if there's a sense here that Solomon does not believe in a God, or far from it. But never is the word for God used, which is Yahweh, which is Lord. In other words, a personal relationship with God as Lord and the revelation of God coming in. So, that's the sort of quick background to this book. What does Solomon find and what does he conclude with all his wealth and all his wisdom? Well, he finds this. He finds a predetermined season and a fixed time for everything. Patterns, cycles, patterns, cycles that are unescapable. Events that occur over and over again through the history of mankind that do not change. They happen again and again and again. And indeed, mankind is locked into this recurring cycle and pattern. In verses 1 to 8, which we read, there were 28 different activities that were mentioned. And it's quite interesting because one of the commentators in this book mentioned that this is an exhaustive list, an exhaustive list. The complete number in the Bible is the number seven. You may know that. The number in the Bible for the earth or for the world, and not just in the Bible, but in normal society is the number four, the four corners of the earth, for example. And this man was making the point that seven times four is 28. There are 28 activities mentioned here. This is an exhaustive list that Solomon has come up with as he observes life and the behaviour of mankind. As I mentioned before, as I listened to this at school assembly, I had no idea what I was meant to take away from this as a younger person. What was the motivation? What was the inspiration? What was I to take from this as I was growing up and, and moving on in life? I've come to understand actually that that was the right thing to be thinking because it's not exactly clear, is it? Because of those 28 activities, 14 of them are positive things, good things, nice things. 14 of them are negative things, bad things, horrible things. We're born, we die. We break down, we build up. Weeping, laughing, mourning, dying, gaining, losing. And as you come to the end of this passage, you start to realise that they all just seem to cancel themselves out. And to put it another way, it's a nil-sum game. And you start to get to the point of, when you think about what the point is of this passage, you almost start to understand that, well, there doesn't seem to be any point. It's a nil-sum game. And friends, this is the conclusion. Without the revelation of God, without taking into account eternity, when you exclude these things and just think about life, I'm afraid to say it's a bit of a nil-sum game. Now, don't get me wrong, there are important things in life, and family and relationships, there are a lot of important things, don't get me wrong. But we're born, and we die. You know, Solomon says it, he says that when you think about all these things, that there is a travail, it's hard work. And he goes on in verse 11 to say that God has put everything beautiful in its own time. 
But the problem is that without the revelation of God, mankind just doesn't know what to make of it. The world is in their heart. No man can find it out from the beginning to the end. And in the end of the day, Solomon concludes in chapter 3, verse 12, that these things are so confusing and so difficult and so uninspiring that what else can man say but to just try and be happy, to rejoice, and to try and do good in life. That's a bit like the mantra of the world, isn't it, today? If we just really try to be happy and just try to do our best, that's really all we can do, isn't it? It's a little bit sad, really. And it's not a popular conclusion. You know, if I was to go to a university this evening, and, well, it's freshman week almost, and you're not really allowed to do anything, I'm hearing. Just <laughs> pretty bad. Um, but if you were to get up and this was to be your message, I think you'd be booed off the stage, right? It would not be a popular message. I don't think I'd be going on any speaking tours. I don't think I'd be winning any awards for motivational speaking. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult message. It doesn't make it any less true. When God is taken out, and when the revelation of God is not factored in, and when eternity is excluded, and when we look at just life, it is a nil-sum game. A nil-sum game. There is no satisfaction. There is no lasting joy or satisfaction. Indeed, what does Solomon conclude? He concludes that trying to find lasting satisfaction in this life, in temporal things, is just vanity. It's like grasping at the wind. We'll just never catch it. Now, you may think, well, this is a very negative message very negative message but let's be honest you don't have to be the wisest man in the world to know these things are true you don't have to have lived for very long to know that some of these things are very very true you don't have to look at celebrities and famous people the people with all the wealth and with all the reasons to be happy and you look at their lives and you know that they cannot find lasting satisfaction and lasting joy these things are true the things that Solomon has written down here are true. We'll never find lasting joy or satisfaction just in temporal things here on earth. Two very famous theologians said this one was Pascal and one was Augustine. Pascal said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of man. And without God, we'll never be satisfied. Augustine said, God has made us for himself and our heart will find no rest until it rests in God. God has made us for himself and our heart will find no rest until it rests in God. We see this in life as well, don't we? We have this innate desire in ourselves to worship. You see it at the football stadiums, you see it at concerts, you see it in the worship of celebrity and different things. There is a desire in mankind to worship. And that worship should be for God. God made us to worship him. To live for him. To have a relationship with him. Now it's not all wisdom that just came from Solomon himself. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, right in the very last chapter in verse 1, there's a very well known verse. And Ecclesiastes, uh, sorry, Solomon says this. At the end of his book, he concludes, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Or put another way, remember your Creator when you've got the chance, before it's too late. That's the message I'd like to leave you from this particular passage. Remember these things that cancel themselves out. Remember this nil-sum game. Remember the fact that lasting satisfaction can never be found in temporal things. Solomon says, remember your creator when you've still got the chance in the days of your youth. A time to be born and a time to die. I want to speak to you very quickly about appointments. Now, maybe we've not got as many appointments as we used to have. Um, I'm still working from home right now, so there are still appointments every day in the morning. I'll check my diary, how many meetings, how many Zoom meetings, etc., I'm sure many people are the same right now. Now, some appointments are made by us, things that we want to be doing or are important to us. Unfortunately, many appointments are made for us. Uh, 
uh, as an example, sometimes there's an appointment, so we need to go to the hospital. We'd rather not. You might sometimes get an appointment made for you when you're asked to go to court and be on a jury, for example. And these are appointments that are made for us. Not necessarily things that we want to do. But you know, our life is ultimately made up of a lot of appointments, aren't it? The two most important appointments in any of our existence is the appointment when we were born and the appointment when we die. And the amazing thing about these two appointments is that we have absolutely no seal of either of them. You know, as humans, we like to think we're in control, but we're really not in control very much. And the two most important appointments are when we're born and when we die. If I was to ask you, do you remember the day you were born and what you were doing? Well, you may have seen some video footage or some photos, but you don't remember it. Of course you don't. You had no say in it, you had no control over it. Uh, but one of the things with COVID that's become very clear to me is the world, mankind, trying to control death. I'm afraid to say that there is an appointment that's been made when one day we'll die, and we don't have any control over it. We might like to think we do, but we don't. God has made that appointment. God knows exactly when we'll die. God knows exactly how we will die. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. An appointment has been made. It's inescapable. I was looking at this word appointment and um, one of the places you see it a lot is when you go into your fridge and you get your tomato ketchup. And there's just nearly like tomato ketchup still. Fair enough. And it says, by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. That's quite an interesting phrase. But when you, when you read the meaning of the word appointment, what you will see is that that word appointment is the Queen almost saying, being made to stand. Being made to stand. That's the context of that meaning. Something that's been made to stand before the Queen, before the King. The Bible says in Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once to die, but the Last part of that verse is this. But after this, the judgment. You see, my friend Luke, he believes that when he dies, that's it. There's no more, there's nothing else. That is not what God says. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says there is eternity. And in that verse in Hebrews, after we die, there is eternity. There is going to be a judgment. And the word appointment there, we will be made to stand. And every man and woman and boy and girl will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can do that in one of two ways. We can either stand before him and see him and know him as our saviour. Or we can stand before him and we will know him as our righteous judge. That's a very, very sobering thought. I hope everyone in here knows with confidence that they will meet him one day as their Lord and as their saviour. Their sins forgiven and cleansed and dealt with because they're trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and are depending on the blood that he shed on the cross at Calvary to pay the price for our sins. We do not ever want to stand before God as a, our judge. It says in Romans that the wages of sin is death. A very well known verse, the wages of sin is death. There are thousands of textbooks that are written to tell us different ways in which we die. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is an old. There are no textbooks bar this one, which tells us why we have to die. The Bible says we die because of sin. And we are all in the same boat with that. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short of God's glory, we've all disobeyed God, we've all broken God's commandments. And the Bible says because of that, death has come into the world and death has passed through mankind. We all will die 100% death rate. 100% death rate. Thankfully there is an end to that verse as well. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for us on the cross at Calvary and bore the punishment that was reserved for our sin that if we simply trust in him and believe in him and depend on him, that we can have our sins forgiven and have eternal life. But notice it says, by Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
It's for people that know him as their Lord. It's for people that know him as their Saviour. He's died for everyone. He's paid the price for all sin. But we are asked to trust in him and believe in him. You know, many people view God as a God that is going to judge them and a God that is going to condemn them. And for many people, that angers them. And while there is a judgment, as we've just been thinking, the God of the Bible is a God of love. And he's a God of grace. And he's a God of mercy. And we're reading in John chapter 3. And we're reading famous verses, great verses. Think about verses 17 and 18 in particular. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ did not come into the world to condemn it. He came into the world that through him it might be saved. He came to save us. He didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to judge us. He came to save us. And in verse 18, it talks about the fact that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're not condemned. But if we believe not, we're condemned already because we've not believed in his name. You see, sin causes death. We've talked about that already. That is why people die ultimately. All of us. But it is not sin, ultimately, that condemns us, which is interesting. Unbelief, unbelief condemns us. God has made it possible that we will not be judged nor condemned for our sin by giving the very best he had, his only son, on the cross at Calvary. And if we simply believe in him and trust in him and ask forgiveness of our sins through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not be condemned or be judged. There's a wonderful verse in Timothy that says that the Lord Jesus Christ has brought life and light sorry, life and immortality to light through the gospel. Life and immortality. In a society and world, as mentioned in prayer by Simon, that's fearful and fearful of death and all the uncertainties, the message of the gospel is that the Lord Jesus Christ has brought life and immortality do you know with confidence that you have that life through the Lord Jesus Christ and by your trusting in him? So I've got one more little story to tell you as we finish. You know, it's maybe just me, but there's been so many different ways that I've been thinking about mortality this year, even outside of the virus. That's the last mention of it, I promise. Um, but at the end of January, there was a very famous sportsman that died in America, a man called Kobe Bryant. I'm not really expecting too many people. Kobe Bryant is, or was, I should say. He was 41 years old. He died in a, a tragic helicopter accident, and unfortunately, uh, a couple of young children with him as well. A, really, a real tragic accident. And uh, there was a real outpouring of grief in America on social media and different mediums, because this was a very famous sportsman, basketball player, won a championship on numerous occasions, was very much known for his strength of mind, determination. He had almost a sort of invincible veer, if you like, around about him. He was a winner. He was a winner in the world's eyes. On the sports field, wealth, different things. He was a winner. And when somebody like that dies at the age of 41, unexpectedly, suddenly, people are shocked. And it brings really home our mortality, doesn't it? I spent a lot of time with my cousin growing up. We both played a bit of sport together. We both actually liked playing a bit of basketball together, him especially. And he started texting me around about that. And I knew that he was quite disturbed by this. He's not a Christian. And uh, Ryan was really struggling with this because this was a person that he looked up to. Celebrity and sportsman again this year. And he was just shocked that somebody he'd watched and admired and almost had that invincible near about him had died and he was struggling with it. He was struggling with it. I got sent a video from a TV station in America just shortly after that and there was a man called Pat Williams was speaking and we've been thinking about Solomon tonight. He was a wealthy man. He was a wise man. This man Pat Williams, I know he's a wealthy man because he owns a sports franchise in America and that makes you very wealthy as it happens. 
But I would suggest he is also a wise man because he was speaking about the death of Kobe Bryant and live on television, a very large network in the US. He said this, I'm just going to quote it, it's fantastic. He said that there has been a great outpouring of emotion because of the death of this man, Kobe Bryant. And I know people are struggling with it. But I just want to take the time to say this. God knows exactly when we are born. He knows exactly when we're going to die. The most important thing in between all of that is what we do with Jesus Christ. And that hit me so hard when I watched that. And I sent it on to my cousin. I don't know what he's going to make of it. But that's the message tonight. The two great appointments were born. We die. We have no say over either of them. God knows. The circumstances and when they're going to be. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in between. Some of it's important, but the reality is without the revelation of God, it's a nil-sum game. It's a nil-sum game. The most important thing is what we do with Jesus Christ. May you take him as your saviour. May you know with confidence that you have eternal life. That the fear of death is no longer upon you because you're looking forward to that day when you go to know the Lord Jesus Christ face to face as your saviour and your Lord. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we want to thank you again for this short time we've spent together. We thank you again for thy many blessings. We thank you above all things again for thy Son, the Lord Jesus. We recognise, Father, what he did for us in coming into this world and taking on flesh and living a perfect, sinless, holy life and going to the cross at Calvary to give his life a ransom for many, to pay the price for our sin so that we don't have to. We realise, Father, that there's a day coming for each and every one of us. We don't know when that we will die, but we thank you for those that know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Saviour, that they have the gift of eternal life and sins forgiven. What a wonderful blessing it is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. If there is anyone in the audience this evening, Carl, who does not know him as Saviour, who does not have that personal relationship with him, we pray, Father, for salvation to enter it this evening. Speak to us, we ask, Father, through thy gracious Holy Spirit. Help us, Father, in the days that we lie ahead. Bless us as we go into another week. Keep us safe, Father. We ask these things. In